Hello everyone. I hope you're enjoying JupyterCon and staying safe wherever it is that you are. My name is Yuvi and I work for UC Berkeley and I'm one of the co-founders of 2i2c.org, a nonprofit that runs sustainable, transparent, open infrastructure. The goal of this talk is to show you that Jupyter Hub is not just for running Jupyter Notebooks, but can run on any interactive web application that you might want, like our studio, or Linux desktop, Visual Studio Code, or you know just anything else, really. Um, we're going to start off with a small demo that's going to show you how this is going to work. And then we will go through and talk about what really is happening and end with how you can use this. So this is a normal Jupyter Hub, you know, like we just have a login button. This is UC Berkeley's. So it's going to go through their Canvas system and I'm going to authorize this. So usually when this goes back, you're going to end up with, you know, the classic notebook or Jupyter Lab. But this one, it actually ends up in our studio because this is the R Hub. Berkeley has a large community of R users and first class R support um, includes first class R studio support. So this is not just an R studio hub. It also has, you know, like just your regular Jupyter hub things such as, you know, your like notebook server. And so you can, you know, open a Python notebook or an R notebook. Um, and they all coexist in the same environment, with the same libraries and the same home directories. And that's very, very useful. And um, this is all done with this Python package called Jupyter Server Proxy. Uh, it lets you run any web application in your Jupyter Hub notebook server, but only with containers. It relies on some isolation features of containers. So if you don't have containers and you're using something else, it will not work for you yet. Um, but the primary thing that it does is authenticated HTTP proxying. Um, and to talk about the authenticated bit, let's talk about how a regular request to the notebook goes. So JupyterHub does the authentication um, and then it gives the user, you know, like a cookie that uh, lets the notebook server itself uh, verify that this is the correct user for this notebook server. So anytime a request comes in, it's like say slash lab, which renders JupyterLab, there is a part of the notebook server that checks if this is an authorized request for uh, this particular user with, you know, it probably checks cookies. And then if it is allowed, then, you know, it like goes and does the rendering of the Jupyter lab. Uh, this is true for all requests, you know, API requests, classic notebook, terminals, whatever. Um, and Jupyter notebook server has a thing called Jupyter server extensions. Uh, this lets you extend the notebook server in many ways uh, in Python. So this is running on the server side. And one of the most common things to do is to add more things for the HTTP server to be able to do in an authenticated way. And Jupyter Server Proxy uh, uses this to provide proxying to web services that don't know anything about Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so now uh, if you have Jupyter Server Proxy installed, uh, it adds a new endpoint called slash proxy. So if you go to say slash proxy slash 8,000, um, you know, that request goes to the Jupyter Notebook server. It checks for authentication, you know, because we want to make sure that other people on the Jupyter Hub cannot access any of your things. Um, and then if the authentication is right, it then proxies any requests that come uh, into whatever server is running on localhost at port 8,000. And this server doesn't know anything about Jupyter Notebooks or, you know, where it is running, anything at all. It just knows it's running on port 8000 on localhost um, and then everything works out fine. So I'm going to demo this uh, by running a small Flask application. This is a simple Flask application um, and, you know, I'm just going to run it and then I'm going to run app.run. Normally, if you're doing this on your local machine, if we just like go to 127.0.0.1, and then it will show you the thing. But of course, we are running um, on a Jupyter Hub, so that does not work. But because we have Jupyter Server Proxy running, we know we want to access whatever is listening on port 5000 on localhost in the remote system. So I'm just going to take this URL and then change, you know, like slash notebooks to slash proxy and then 5000. And you can see this actually shows us our uh, running Jupyter uh, proxy, right? Like with whatever Flask app it is that we are running. So now if I open this in you know, another container tab, so the user is not authenticated, uh, and then I try to go there, it will just bounce me back to the login and will only allow me to see it if I'm the person uh, whose notebook server it is. 
So, and you know, I can of course like change this up, stop this, and then just, you know, like run, run them both again. And if I go back here, you know, you can see that the changes were made are reflected live. And this is very useful, um, both if you are developing any like applications, but like primarily just as a way to see how the proxying works and how the authentication works. Uh, the other thing uh, that Jupyter Server Proxy does that's probably just as important is it supervises and uh, proxies web apps. It's like in this case, you know, we went and we opened uh, a server that was running fast, but in most cases, people don't actually want to. This brings us to uh, probably the most uh, used part of Jupyter Server Proxy, which is uh, it can also just start and supervise the processes that provide these web services. Because, you know, like in, in the last example, we went and started Slack. Uh, in the last example, we went and started Flask by ourselves, but most of the time, users just want to say, like, you know, run our studio uh, without having to go and start it themselves. So Jupyter Server Proxy can be configured uh, to st to start. So this is in the background that explains that a little bit better. So when a new request comes in, say it's like slash RStudio, the first of course you're authenticated, and then it checks if you if the RStudio process is already running. And if it is running, then it'll just proxy request through as usual. But if it's not running, it will actually start it, um, you know, on a known port, and then proxy the request through. So this means users don't actually have uh, to go and like remember, oh yeah, this is a port and this is a process. Like all of that is handled automatically for you um, by just the admin setting a bunch of config. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show that with like another quick demo. This is a different uh, Jupyter Hub, and you know I'm running Jupyter Lab, and, and you can see that there are launcher icons uh, for the many things that are supported by Jupyter Server Proxy in this Jupyter Hub. Of course, there's RStudio, um, but there's also Linux desktop. This is one of my favorite features. Um, we are proxying with VNC, an entire Linux desktop, and it works pretty well. You can see that this is a server running somewhere in Canada. I am somewhere in India, and the latency is very, very, pretty good. I can actually go to google.com inside here, and it works. So um, this is all, all of this complex machinery is managed by Jupyter Server Proxy, including the proxying required to have this happen uh, with such low latencies. So then, the, of course, the obvious question is, how do you use this, right? Like, all of this exists, you want it, how do you get this into your container? Uh, so the first is, you know, you can just make entries in your Jupyter Notebook config uh, file. Um, if you look at this, uh, it's just like, you know, you tell it what, you know, the URL prefix will be. So in this case, it's code-server. Uh, code-server is a fully open source version of Visual Studio Code that runs in your web browser. Um, and it's actually very cool to have that running in your Jupyter Hub. Uh, so we tell it what command uh, it should execute, what command Jupyter Server Proxy should execute uh, when it starts this. And you know we uh, use the port uh, template variable uh, to tell it what port to start on. We give it 20 seconds to start up because you know it's a heavy application, takes a while. And then we also uh, give it the title, the appropriate title uh, in the Jupyter Lab launcher entry, so people can know what this is. And this is all you need. Like this is the entire contents of what you need uh, to have Code Server running in your Jupyter Hub. Of course, you have to install Code Server as well. Um, or you can use any of the integrated packages. So Jupyter Server Proxy is the base. Um, it only provides the slash proxy endpoint. But Jupyter R Session Proxy uh, is based on Jupyter Server Proxy and uses some of the extension mechanisms there to set up RStudio properly. So you still need to install RStudio separately. It will not actually install RStudio for you. Um, but once you have that, you can just install Jupyter R Session Proxy and that will provide slash RStudio for you without you having to figure out any config at all. Uh, same is true for Jupyter Desktop Server. It does a little bit more complex things. Uh, and it, it currently can only come from Condor Forge, but you just have that on and whatever it is, your favorite uh, Linux you know, desktop manager uh, and things just work. So why would you use this? Uh, Jupyter Hub you know, like gives you like HTTPS, authorization, 
authentication with whatever it is that you need, spawns into a cluster you already have, gives you monitoring, uh, you know, kills users when they are idle, and just all of the things that come with Jupyter Hub for free. So you can just use all of that and then, you know, like the same home directory that people have, the same environment they would have, but just allow them to have different user interfaces because someone might prefer, you know, using Python in Jupyter Notebook and someone might in Jupyter Lab or someone wants to edit text files in Visual Studio Code or whatever, right? Like you want that charge to be theirs. And it also is going to differ based on, you know, what kind of course you're teaching. Sometimes you want them to use RStudio, sometimes you want them to use a terminal. So all of this you can do and get them all done in one place and it adds multi-user capability to web apps that don't have it. Like uh, Visual Studio Code, I think is a good example there because you know if you, you could follow the instructions there and have it running just for you on a VM, but having it run for a hundred students is a lot more work. You can just piggyback onto all of the work that was being done in Jupyter Hub for this um, and then just use that. So what are the limitations we have now? Right now, it only works in container-based environments um, because it depends on process listening on localhost. Uh, it requires network isolation, which is currently available only in container-based environments. We can change that. Uh, it requires that you install the notebook package and the Jupyter server process package inside your container. Uh, if all you want to do is only run RStudio, for example, you might not want any Python there, and this makes the container size a little bit bigger. I know there's someone working on a project called JH Native Proxy, I think, that will help with this, um, and I'll try and link to it. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is just software licenses and trademarks. Uh, RStudio, particularly, is uh, freely licensed but uh, they do have trademarks on it that restrict how you can use that. So I would recommend going and looking at it and making sure you're in compliance. This whole project was started by Ryan Lovett, uh, who is at the stats department in UC Berkeley, um, and lots of contributions from just people all over, like Simon Lee, uh, Tim Head, and Eric Sundell, and just many, many, many other people. And the really nice illustrations here are from Thambi Bhakta. Thank you. And if you're an American citizen, go vote.